Hey bag maker, today I'm going to be talking about new animal zipper pulls in the shop, various fabrics that I've added to my stash. The book review will be for a book called uh, Mosaic Photo, sorry, Stitched Photo Mosaic Quilts. Tonight's bag lab is titled 10 Items for Intermediate Bag Making and there's a great giveaway at the end. I'm Sarah Lawson from Sew Sweetness. Thanks so much for joining me for Social Sunday, my weekly sewing chat. Hey everyone, happy Sunday and welcome to Social Sunday. Thank you for joining us, um, especially after our short holiday break. Um, I see Dawn is watching from New York. Uh, Michelle is wishing everyone a happy new year. Laura's watching from Cleveland and Stacy from New York. So welcome everyone. Just a friendly reminder for Social Sunday, just about everything that I talk about are things that I've purchased myself. So these are not things that I'm getting paid to talk to you about, but just cool things that I found that I'd like to share with you. And everything that I'm scheduled to talk about, I link to in the description. So if you're interested in any of the books, fabrics, notions, or projects that I talk about during Social Sunday, just check that link in the description and you can find out more information there. So um, if you are a Tula Pink fan, you may have seen on her Instagram that she revealed her... Um, she's doing every summer what she calls a deja vu. So a previous fabric line that she's recolored and re-released in sort of a smaller um, grouping. And um, we will have um, that nightshade deja vu is coming out in July. We will have that in the shop. I've already pre-ordered it from the manufacturer. And her next fabric line is coming out in April and it's called Everglow. And we'll have that as well in bagpacks for both. So. Um, I'm super excited. I actually, I admit I forgot about the deja vu that something would be revealed soon. And when I saw that it was going to be nightshade, I was ecstatic because that's one of my favorite tulip pink fabric lines. And um, as you probably are aware, it's really hard to find uh, the original fabric prints um, anywhere online. So I'm really excited to see uh, the new iteration uh, coming out this summer. So we have a few um, animal themed zipper pulls that were just added to the shop a couple days ago. These were designed by Heidi Boyd. Heidi makes amazing wool felted projects, um, embroidery patterns and kits and so on. So I was really excited um, when Heidi and I teamed up to, um, these are Heidi's designs for some new zipper pulls. We have these in all six of the colors that we carry. Um, for zipper pulls and hardware and it features this really cute rabbit. Um, the cat looks very shiny so let me see if I can oh it's super it's shiny on that. camera. Let me let me I have all the other colors here. Let me try to pick out a different color. Maybe the that's very shiny as well. Um, <clears throat> there's two horses, um, a puppy over here so um, lots of cute things. I know a lot of people um, love cats and use cat themed fabric for some of their projects. So I figured this one, let me see if I can find the rainbow cat in my little baggie over here. There it is. Hopefully that design uh, comes up a little bit better um, from our glaring studio lights, but these are available now in the shop. There's a link in the description to the new animal zipper pulls. Uh, so I have a question for you. Let me know in the comments, um, what's your favorite animal? So thinking about adding more zipper pulls in future, let me know what your favorite animal is and maybe we can get some more um, animal zipper pulls added to the shop later in the year. So I have been doing, you may recall that I mentioned over the past couple of years that I started planting uh, Illinois native plants in my yard. And this year was the first time that I decided to do some winter sewing. Um, we use, uh, for me personally, I used uh, plastic milk jugs and Danny and Violet helped me prepare the jugs and I planted uh, potting soil with the seeds. So far I planted uh, 31 different jugs. Danny's gonna put a picture up on the screen. This is what I did so far. Uh, they're all labeled so I know what's in each one and the colored, the green and yellow colors on the sides, uh, that's duct tape. Uh, kind of across the, the center. I cut it almost all the way around and left a little hinge. So if, when I need to open them, I can just kind of uh, slice through the duct tape. 
<clears throat> this is my first year doing it and I learned what I needed to do from a Facebook group that I joined called Winter Sewing. And I still have 21 packets of seeds left. So I'm trying to collect enough uh, milk jugs before the end of January because that's what I decided my cutoff would be. Uh, so hopefully I can collect enough jugs. But Danny, why don't you switch over to the overhead camera? So I purchased all these seed packets from Prairie Moon. And then I have a few that I saved myself um, from some milkweed we have in the yard. But these are just some of the ones that I'm going to be planting. And I'm very excited to see how it turns out. Hopefully most of them have sprouts in the spring. But those uh, little seedlings will be joining uh, the rest of the plants in the yard this spring. And I'm super excited to see what happens with that. So I have another question for you. Let me know in the comments. Uh, what's your favorite plant? Maybe you have a favorite house plant, favorite particular plant that you have in your yard. Uh, let me know in the comments what your favorite is. New fabrics that I've added to my stash, um, I guess I kind of kept, kept it under control uh, over the holidays as far as ordering new fabrics, but I do have a few new ones um, that I wanted to share with you. I've always loved orange peel quilts, and so when I saw these fabrics designed by Annabelle Wrigley, I knew I had to snap them up. Um, I'm not sure what I'll make with them, but I feel like it might be larger pouches. Um, super love the bright colors and the prints, and there's other fabrics in the line, but these are the only two um, that I picked up this time. This one arrived the other day, and it was the only one that I picked up from the fabric line, but I just really loved the bright colors. I guess the colors really spoke to me and um, I'm thinking maybe like an aeroplane bag or a cavalcade travel bag for this one. I'm not sure yet. I picked up a few. Lately, I've, lately fabrics when I look on Etsy, I've recently fallen in love with a lot of Marsha Durst designs and some of these are from, a couple of these are from her and one of them is from someone else. This one is from someone else, but I kind of liked the textural nature of all three of these. I know they're just sort of random, but I guess as bag makers, random works for us. They don't necessarily need to go uh, together. And then I don't buy a lot of licensed fabrics, but I really love Monsters, Inc. So I picked up these two to go together. I thought this would be a great lining. This may be ex exterior fabric, or actually they would look good also reversed. Maybe this one exterior, this one lining. I'm not sure yet, but um, thought they were cute. Liked the colors, so I picked up these two as well. Links to all of the fabrics that I shared tonight are in the description in case you're interested in checking those out after the show. I am a fan of this author for the tonight's book review, Tim Natar. Um, she makes uh, mosaic quilts um, generally from photographs and she came out with a new book which I snapped up immediately. Um, most of her previous mosaic quilts are kind of featured in here and then she discusses um, how to get started in making your own mosaic quilts. So I'm gonna flip through the book. Danny's gonna switch to the overhead and I'm going to show you some of the projects. Um, so some of these are just inspiration from projects she's made in the past. And then near the back of the book, um, there's instructions for practicing uh, to make your own projects. So I'm going to start flipping through these again. A lot of these are um, her previous quilts that she's made. Here's the photo on the left. There's the quilt that she made from the photo on the right. I think it looks spectacular. I love the texture that the fabric gives uh, to that image. And a lot of them are inspired from photographs of animals. So there's a horse, love that one. She has done several with chickens. Love the chicken ones too. And I just, I just think it's so great um, to make an art quilt from a photograph of either your favorite person or your favorite animal. The sheep one was really great because of the little swirls at the top of the head. And then here's a self portrait over here. So fantastic. I love, I super love every single one um, that was featured in the book. And here's her um, zooming chickens quilt. 
She has a few other examples of some of her other quilts in the book as well. Not all of them are from photographs of animals. So the, the first part of the book, as with most books, uh, is talking about the basics of whatever the technique is covered. And so since photographs are used as the basis for the quilts, um, the author discusses what types of photographs will, would work best, um, such as the example, this was the original photograph and she cropped it so that the subject was taking up most of the photo and there's just a small amount of background. These two photos up here, this one's really dark and hard to see all the different values, but this one in this chicken photo, you can see all of the colors, uh, different shades and so on. So um, color wheel is discussed using different colors, um, what types of prints to choose. I'm not going to go through all of that just because that's kind of the secret sauce of the book. Um, but chapter three is the basic construction techniques using the example of the blue daisy. So she walks you through this particular chapter, how to work with the photo, um, how to select fabrics, how to work with curves. And I thought this one was really detailed and super informative. <clears throat> Then there's the practice project. So obviously the first practice project is super basic. The leaf, not too many colors involved, but it gives you a chance to make some selections and practice working with the curves. Um, because I should mention these are, um, I believe they're not applique. So that's why working with the curves is really important. And in that previous chapter, some of that was discussed working with the curves. And these are the projects to work from, uh, from the book. So the templates for these projects are all in the back of the book, um, meaning um, just an outline of the project. And then she walks you through each project, how to put it together. And I thought it was great to have the pra practice projects because obviously everyone will want to work from their own photograph, but it's good to work on practice projects first so that you can get the hang of things before um, you work on uh, one of your beloved uh, photographs. So again, the book is called Stitched Photo Mosaic Quilting and the link to this book is in the description. <coughs> Alright, Danny's favorite part of the Sunday show when he's not on it. We'd like to invite all of the bag makers to stand proud. Let us know in the comments that you're part of the uh, So Sweetness squad. Danny and I are both very grateful that you've tuned in for the show. And uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day uh, to watch our show. Um, I missed your lives. I was just twitching and scratching. Can't wait to receive my gorgeous cork. Welcome back, Miss Sarah and Danny. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, I saw on Facebook earlier today, people were uh, excited for the return of the show after our short holiday break. So um, thank you so much for tuning in to the show. So tonight's bag lab. Oh, Danny, are you ready for bag lab? What? Are you ready for Bag Lab? We're interrupting the show for a special report. Because now it is time for Bag Lab. So tonight's Bag Lab was a suggestion that was emailed to me. And unfortunately, usually I try to do um, a good job of keeping track who emailed what suggestion because I really appreciate emailed suggestions for the show. Um, but this was from a suggestion that was emailed and I earlier today I couldn't find the name of the person that I had written down uh, for the suggestions so I really appreciate you and I'm sorry I, I um, misplaced your name but the topic for tonight's bag lab is 10 items for intermediate bag making so a couple months ago I had a bag lab discussion about um, a basic beginner bag making toolkit and um, now we're going to take it up a notch and discuss items uh, for your intermediate level bag making. So um, some of these are previously filmed videos that we'll be rebroadcasting um, because again it's 10 different items and some of them I'll be demonstrating live. But these are basically things um, if you've got a couple bags under your belt at least um, and you want to um, Kind of embrace your creativity and try to branch out and add more things to your bag making skill set these are the things to add so the first thing that i wanted to talk about is <clears throat> chicago screws so we'll be discussing 
rivets in depth, different um, items to go along with adding rivets to your bags. But the very first step up is Chicago screws. Um, and the reason that Chicago screws are only a step up is because you don't need a tabletop press or a hand press. You don't need any extra tools, um, just um, something to make the holes and then the Chicago screws themselves. And so um, our first item on the list uh, for intermediate bag making is Chicago screws. Different ideas and so Chicago screws was next on the list. Danny's gonna cut out to the side view um, so I can show you what the Chicago screws look like. I purchased these from Emmeline Bags. Um, this is the 3 8 of an inch size. So that's what this looks like. So it comes with um, a screw portion over here. You can clearly see that's where you're gonna be attaching this um, Phillips head screwdriver. And then the other side has sort of a opening for the screw and this is the front side of the rivet. So I, before the chat, I attached one of these guys right here. I have to admit, I am disappointed that I didn't purchase the quarter inch size instead. This is a 3 eighths, uh, three eighths of an inch size. I have a piece of fabric attached to the foam interfacing and I'm assuming you might have a strap over here but as you can see there's kind of a quite a gap over here I think for what I'm making or what I would be using these for I think the quarter inch size would have been much better but this is what I have so I just wanted to show you how these are installed since um, I had a few questions on how to how to do these so I went ahead and used my rivet press to make a hole here you can certainly use a handheld hole punch as well and I'm going to install the nice side or the, the right side of the rivet through the hole. And then this just screws in. Um, you might consider putting a bit of fabric glue in here before, right before you screw this in place and that'll make it more permanent. But anyway, just really simple to take this Phillips head screwdriver and just screw this in place. And then that means you don't need to keep a rivet press or even a handheld rivet press. So this, these are really easy to install and screw in. Um, I bought some with the iridescent uh, rainbow finish, but there's other finishes at Emmeline Bags if you're interested in shopping there. And again, like I said, you might want to consider getting the quarter inch size instead, but um, the application and screwing them in would be the same. So anyway, these are Chicago screws. Again, these are an alternative to rivets and rivet presses and super easy to install as you can see. So Chicago screws come in different post heights and um, what was shown in that particular demonstration was a Chicago screw with a little bit of extra room between the cap and the fabric. Um, an easy fix if you don't want to keep several sizes of Chicago screws in your, in your stash is to add a little scrap of interfacing on the wrong side before you screw that Chicago screw in place, such as a piece of Peltex. And the Peltex can definitely help um, kind of close the gap um, if you have sort of a thinner piece, like just that exterior fabric that was shown in the demonstration. Um, oftentimes, added thickness comes from straps that are attached to, say, the front and the back of the bag. So um, you definitely have a few options as far as the Chicago screws go. So. Um, of course, the step up from the Chicago screws is um, rivets and a rivet press. And so here is a discussion about my rivet press and um, the different items and the different dies that I use um, on the rivet press to install rivets and other things such as grommets. Okay, so these are all of the accessories that I have to go along with my rivet press. And I'm just using an old Orifil container, but you can use any plastic container with a lid to keep everything contained. All right, so let me run through all of the, the dies that I have for my machine. And unfortunately, each item, like for example, rivets or grommets requires a different die and each size also requires its own die. So let me start off with the dies that make holes. So here's the die that I have. So um, this goes on the bottom and this goes on the top of my hand press. And this just makes a very tiny hole in the fabric. And I use this for if I need to make a hole for installing a twist lock for the screws that go in the twist lock. So that's just um, a hole punch. I have a three millimeter hole punch. And this is what I use for installing rivets. So this is a rivet and that's the post on the rivet. So that's what I would use for um, this hole as well as a three millimeter grommet. So. 
here's the three millimeter grommet and I like to use the three millimeter grommets for making holes in the fabric for uh, going along with a buckle so the tongue of the buckle would go through that hole so let me leave those both out so that I'll do both the grommet and the rivet making the holes only and I also have a hole punch for making a six millimeter hole and this is good for those five millimeter grommets so this makes the hole for this piece of hardware to go through okay next up I have my rivet tool and this is my most used tool and this piece goes on the bottom and this goes on the top and it has sort of a little indentation where the head of the rivet or the cap of the rivet will settle so here's my rivet as you can see this area is curved and that will just fit right in there and this is for eight millimeter rivets and I also have some nine millimeter rivets and they both actually fit in the same die all right, finally I have my dies for my grommets. So this is a die for installing a three millimeter grommet and the grommet is the one with the hole that looks like this and that piece will just settle in the die like that. So this die is for the three millimeter grommets and I also have a die for five millimeter grommets and it's laid out kind of the same way, just obviously bigger piece to fit the bigger grommet right there. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to make holes in a strap piece and install a rivet. So I've already sewn my strap piece and I pressed this and top stitch kind of like double fold bias tape. So my strap is ready to go and I'm first for the rivets going to make a hole. So this is the medium size hole punch die that I showed you. This larger circle piece is going to go in the bottom of the, the die like this. And then the part that will be punching the hole, I'm going to screw into this top portion. And when I got my dies, I, it came with instructions for putting a piece of scrap fabric on this bed so that the hole punch wouldn't tear up the bottom part of the die. I'm going to leave that off for now just so you can see everything clearly. So on my strap piece, I'm going to take my fabric marker and I'm going to make a mark where I'm going to be installing the rivet. And I find that that helps because often you want the rivet to be centered and having that mark there will help you line everything up on the machine. So I've got my mark on the fabric strap and I'm just going to bring down the handle of the press and punch a hole. And I like to keep an awl handy and I like using this clover awl and basically this is just um, a pointy tool and I'm going to point poke out the fabric just to make sure there's a clean hole there. Okay, so now it's ready to install the rivet in the hole, and I like using double capped rivets, and double cap means it, it looks nice on both front and back. And one of the halves of the rivet has sort of like a, a hole in the middle, and the other one has a post, which will go inside like that. So I'm just going to place mine right through the hole, and on the back, the other cap piece, and it'll just push into place and snap, but it's not finished just yet. I'm going to swap out my rivet die and put this one to the side for now. And again, I use this rivet die for both the 8mm and the 9mm rivets. This particular rivet is 8mm with an 8mm post, and that's the kind that I use most often. So I usually like to put the portion with the post um, against the bottom of the machine like that and then kind of just nestle it in the metal of the die and then just push down. Okay so that's what that rivet looks like when it's installed. I also have other rivets that are 9 millimeter rivets with a 10 millimeter post and that just means that the, the cap on the rivet is slightly larger and the post is also longer. I don't use these very often. It's good for, say, if you're doubling up a strap and you're using really thick material like maybe leather or cork. These 9mm rivets with that 10mm post would be helpful for that, but normally I just use these 8mm rivets with the 8mm post. Okay, so now let me show you how to install the grommets. So I'll install both the 3mm and the 5mm grommets. So I'm going to swap out 
the die pieces for that. So we'll start with the three millimeter grommet, which is, as I mentioned before, good for buckles for that tongue piece to go through the hole. So again, I'm going to use that same hole punch die that I used before. Okay, and again, I'm going to mark where I want that grommet to go. And make that hole. Okay, so now time to swap out for the grommet die. And this is again for three millimeter grommets. So here's what the die looks like. That's the bottom piece. And this is the piece that's gonna go on the top. Okay, so the grommet comes with two pieces. One piece has sort of a, a post with a hole through it. And the other piece is very tiny. It's just a flat piece of metal, a circle. Okay, so I like to use this one to go through the fabric first. This will go through the right side of the fabric. And on the back side, I'm just gonna slip that little metal disc. Okay, so the part with the, the post is gonna go on the bottom portion of the die. And the top portion is basically just going to bend the back side of the grommet. So this is what it looks like from the back, and this is what it looks like from the front. Okay, so one more grommet to show you, and that's the 5 millimeter grommet. So I'm going to use my 6 millimeter hole punch. And if you'll notice, the hole punch is slightly larger than the actual grommet. This is what it looks like. Again, this flat piece goes on the bottom. And this piece with the hole screws in the top and again I'm going to mark a spot to install the grommet and if your hole punch doesn't punch the hole all the way through the fabric just go ahead and flip to the wrong side and punch it again okay so let me poke out that, that fabric and grab my grommet piece. And again, the portion with the post is going to go on the bottom portion of the machine. And then the little flat circle is going to be pointed toward the top of the machine. Okay, and again, the post is going to go through the right side of the fabric, and then that little circular disc is going to go on the wrong side. Okay. Okay, so that's what that larger grommet looks like when it's installed. And it's important to mention that not every rivet press will be used with every die. So I would highly recommend wherever you purchased your rivet press from, and I'll have some links in the description to this video, but wherever you buy the press from, I would suggest buying your dies from as well because not all dies are interchangeable with every machine. Okay, so if that tabletop press is not within reach for you economically right now, there are also handheld presses available. So I found this handheld press on Amazon for less than $40, and it includes um, a hole punch pliers with different sizes of holes, and a grommet handheld press, and also one for snaps. So let me, let me open this up and show you the pieces that are inside this package. Okay, so here's the handheld press that will make holes, and if you'll notice, it's got this little metal plate kind of similar to that tabletop press, and it'll make different size holes. So I'll start with the hole that it was on when it came in the package. And again, I'm going to take my fabric strap, and I'm just going to punch a hole in it. Okay. 
And this one takes a lot of strength. I find that it, it's not as easy as that tabletop press, especially if your hands are a little bit on the weak side like mine are. Yeah, this one's kind of hard to, to punch the hole through. I got it, but it was really difficult. Okay, and as you can see, it comes with um, the pliers for the grommets like I had before, but looks like it's just for the one size. So the grommets are just going to settle on the plates on either side, and then the same thing for the snaps. But this handheld press is a good option, but I feel like nothing beats that tabletop press for ease of just leverage, pushing down, as opposed to kind of squeezing together with your hands. Okay, so there were a couple of live questions that were coming through while that demonstration was airing. So um, Danny, uh, let me know that there were a few questions for me. Um, Debbie wanted to know, can you do snaps with this press? Um, yes, you can do a huge variety of different things. Unfortunately, generally each different thing will need its own die. Um, the beginning of that demonstration, I was showing you all my different dies I had for the rivets and the grommets. Um, the snaps will have their own die as well. I also have a die for my press for installing magnetic snaps, which is super awesome. Um, these magnetic snaps installed on the rivet press sort of have a cap on the back, kind of like a, a large rivet. Um, um, but there's a huge, gigantic amount of different um, things you can install using the rivet press. Vernita says, do you put the post piece going from front to back or is the post piece from um, back to front? So that's a really good question. Um, generally, either one is okay. I did notice on my rivet press that um, I generally, and feel free to test this out, I always recommend testing on a scrap of fabric, um, installing different things first. But I find with my rivet press, I usually like to install with... Um, the forward facing side or the right side of the fabric face down on my rivet press just because I usually get um, kind of a little crimp in the metal from um, the piece of the die that's on the top. And so that's why I like to have um, the nice or the forward side of forward facing side of the rivet um, face down on my press if that makes sense. Angie said, outside of this demonstration, do you facet the rivet press to a base? That's a really good question. I personally don't. In that particular video, I had it on top of a <clears throat> sort of like a, a wood covered, a, a foam covered wood mat, and it was kind of moving around a bit. Um, but in all honesty, the rivet press is quite heavy. I'm not sure how heavy it is, but I would say it's probably at least 20 pounds or more. And so um, generally, I'm, I'm usually using... Um, kind of like a lower table for when I'm installing the rivet press uh, rivets into whatever bag I'm making. And so it kind of allows me to have more uh, leverage, I guess. Um, in that particular video, that tabletop was quite high. Um, but with a heavy press, um, it's generally not moving around so much. Uh, Mirabel says, I uh, wanted to suggest to practice first on a piece of material before you actually place it on your bag. That's a really great tip. Um, I practice all the time, especially when changing up different substrates or using different th different thicknesses, um, because sometimes if I'm using a th much thicker strap than normal, say um, it's a thicker vinyl, you want to make sure that your post length it, post length is appropriate, um, because there's different post le post lengths available. Um, you want to make sure that. Um, uh, you won't have either extra spacing or your fabric might be crunched more than uh, what you would like. So testing it out first is the best way to ma make sure that it's um, an appropriate length for your project. Susan says, recommendation for Rivet Press brand. I personally purchased my Rivet Press from Minkus Margo on Etsy. I like her shop on Etsy because she has tons of dyes and she also sells the rivets and other things separately. Um, Cam Snap Press is also a good website. That's where I got my die for the magnetic snaps. And so um, those are a couple of really great options. And I feel like Minkus Margo has been around for years. And also um, I feel like Cam Snaps is a trusted brand as well. Okay, so coming in at numbers three and four on the list are 
my acrylic templates for installing purse feet and then there's another one for installing help with installing rivets and placing them um, we do have a lot of acrylic templates in the shop a lot of them are for specific bag patterns um, but um, we have we also have a bunch that I like to call our technique um, acrylic templates um, such as these two or the seam guide that can be used for many different purposes not just for a particular pattern um, so I'm going to be demonstrating um, those two acrylic templates next and for tonight is uh, two new acrylic templates that we have in the shop um, we have one for um, aligning purse feet on your fabric and another for um, getting your rivets uh, placed on your handles or straps. I have to tell you a story about this rivet centering ruler. This one's probably been about a year in the making. Um, Ed and Robin, who make all of our acrylic templates out in Arizona, uh, we worked on uh, so some sort of riveting, rivet ruler um, quite a while ago, I want to say almost a year ago, and I got it back and something felt like it was missing from the template but I didn't know quite what it was or where to go from there so it sat on my bookcase for about a year and um, finally came back around to it um, not by force but it just happened um, I had some more ideas to add to it and um, this is the final ruler so um, we're gonna switch back over to the overhead and I'll show you how to use first the purse feet um, actually let me hold this up there we go over some pink fabric so you can see it a little better so um, this is the purse feet um, alignment ruler there are measurements um, starting with one inch and going um, every half inch after that so one inch one and a half inches two inches all the way up to, to five inches you'll notice there's some holes and the holes are big enough to um, accommodate a, a friction pen which is one of my favorite marking tools and um, I've prepared a, a piece, as you can see, this is a bottom panel for, for a bag. I've got some purse feet already inserted and I've got another piece over here. The fabric is already attached to foam interfacing and I'm gonna show you how to use the ruler. So in a lot of my patterns, if I'm going to have optional purse feet, I'll give you the measurements for where to install them. You can also, if you're working from a pattern that doesn't have um, purse feet built into the pattern or you just like to add your own, um, you can use this template. So I'm going to go off of a measurement that I like to use a lot for purse feet off of a rectangle or square bottom panel and that's one and a half inches. So you'll notice on two of the side edges there's dashes and there's some on this side as well. So the dashes are just like a general ruler every quarter inch quarter inch half inch three quarters and then one inch so the two edges with the dashes you're going to line up on the raw edges of your fabric and then I'm looking for the one and a half inch measurement so I'm going to go ahead and take my friction pen make the marking through the template I'm going to just swivel my template again so the dashed edges are aligned with the raw edges of the fabric again looking for one and a half inches and I'm going to do the same thing for the remaining two edges All right, that was fast and easy, um, takes the guesswork out of it, and then you'll just install the purse feet like you normally would. I use my seam ripper, and I kind of usually like to angle it in toward the corner, and you always want to start with a smaller slit because you can always make a smaller slit bigger. And especially if I'm using quilting cotton or another fabric that will fray, I always like to put a dab of seam sealant on the holes before I insert the purse feet. So I'm going to use this fray block. Oh, I guess that was uh, really raring to go, that, that little bottle. And then I'm just going to be inserting the purse feet through uh, the right side of the fabric. And if you've noticed that your slits are too small, like I mentioned, you can always make them bigger. Okay, so you'll do the same thing to insert all four purse feet. And then you'll just flip to the wrong side of the fabric and open the prongs outward. So this is what it will look like with all of the four purse feet installed. I also pulled out a panel of fabric because not all bottom panels of bags are, you know, squared off edges. So I've got one with uh, rounded edges over here. You will use the purse uh, feet alignment ruler in a similar manner. I'm going to align the edges with the dashes along the raw, the, the raw straight edges of the fabric 
And since I need a darker marking tool, I'm gonna to be using this uh, Tandy Leather pen, which I demonstrated on a previous episode of Social Sunday. And instead of one and a half inches from the corner, which is kind of close to the edge of the fabric, I think I might go with two inches instead. And you'll mark it in the same manner that we did with that previous demonstration. So really quick and easy. There's other measurements included in case you're working with a really big panel of fabric, and um, that's how to use the purse feet alignment ruler. Okay, one more demonstration with the second acrylic template that came in. Um, actually, I'm gonna hold it up against the, I'm gonna grab some pink fabric to hold it up against just so you can see all of the measurements. So this particular ruler is 12 inches long, and you'll notice there's three separate sections of this uh, template. So I decided to go with the three separate sections. Um, this section, all of the holes are half inch apart. The middle section, all of the holes are three quarters of an inch apart. And this third section, all of the holes are one inch apart, and those are marked. So this is marked one inch spacing, three quarter inch spacing, and half inch spacing. Another thing that I decided to add to this ruler is um, one inch bars. Um, now I know that not every strap or handle is one inch wide, but I found that having these bars is helpful because even if your strap is wider, say for example, your strap is one and a half inches, you can still center this and quickly mark out your um, hole. So the thing I found in the past when using a regular quilting ruler to make marks for my rivets is I was often um, in a hurry or choosing the wrong measurements or not paying attention and sometimes I would have a rivet um, every one inches and then I'd make a mistake and one would be half inches a half inch away from the last and so this acrylic template takes out the guesswork and um, makes sure that you don't make mistakes like those that I've made in the past so first I'm going to pull out a bag that I'm working on. As you can see, I've already attached the handles to the exterior portion of the bag. Um, this is already attached to the foam interfacing. And I am going to go ahead and use the one inch spacing on the ruler. So I'm going to align the bottom edge with the bottom edge of the fabric just so that when I move over to the second side of the handle, I can make sure I'm my measurements are equal. You, you can see I aligned the handle in between um, that one inch spacing. So you'll just align that with the edges of your fabric. And I'm gonna start with two inches because I don't wanna be so close to the bottom. So I'm gonna measure, uh, mark with my Tandy leather marker every one inch. And I'm gonna stop over here with the eight inches. As you can see, my mark's clearly right there. And then I'm gonna move over to the second and make the rest of the markings. And as I mentioned, there's different spacings. So if you prefer your rivets to be a little bit closer together, no problem, just choose um, either three quarters of an inch or half inch and it'll be the same process. So um, I'm not going to actually install rivets on, on this demonstration because um, I do already have a video that's a little bit longer showing how to install rivets, but um, here's the back of the bag. Um, I used the same increments um, using the ruler and I installed the rivets and I don't think I've ever had rivets um, look so nice. Um, uh, what else was I gonna say? If you have not installed rivets before or would like to learn a little bit more about that, I have a video on my YouTube channel. You can just do a search on the Sew Sweetness channel for um, rivets and um, I can show you how I work my rivet press, a little bit more information about dies and rivet sizes and all that is included in that video. So I have a thicker strap just to show you that this acrylic template also works for straps that are wider than one inch. So I'm going to go ahead and um, that one inch bar, I'm just gonna go ahead and center that in between my top stitching and that will easily allow me to make the markings down the center of the handle or strap. Okay, so that's the demonstration for the rivet centering ruler and the purse feet alignment tool. And I hope you enjoyed that. And um, I know your traditional quilting rulers will get the job done just as well. But if you'd like a little bit of fuss free marking, um, that's the rivet centering tool and the purse feet alignment ruler. And we have them both in stock on our website. And the link is in the description in case you'd like to check those out.
Okay, while we're on the topic of rivets, it's inevitable. It will happen to you at some point. Um, and it's happened to me a few times in the past um, as well. Um, but you'll go to install a rivet and perhaps it'll go in crooked and it, or it'll be halfway uh, in the cap and you'll need to take it out. So anytime I've installed one crooked, it really made me sweat and worry that I had ruined the bag. Um, but this rivet removal tool will take away all the, the worry and have that uh, faulty rivet out um, lickety split. So here's the demonstration of the rivet removal tool. Tool from Clumhouse used to remove rivets. So Danny's removed a couple of rivets for me in the past. Um, usually they were inserted and sort of went in crooked and uh, he had to remove them with, I think he said needle nose pliers and uh, a cutter to get those out. I was using this tool earlier today and it's so much easier. It makes it so much easier to remove the rivets. So I'm gonna have Danny switch to the overhead camera. This is what the tool looks like and it also comes with this uh, piece made of metal. This is not sharp, it's kind of a, a blunt uh, tip over here. And this tool feels like it's made out of acrylic. It's sort of got beveled edges on the right side and then on the, the back side it's just straight and it's got four different openings. So this demonstration is meant for double cap rivets. Uh, those are the ones that I usually use and if you're not familiar with them one side has uh, the post and the other side has sort of an opening and the the cap once inserted it looks like a nice rivet on both the right and the wrong side so earlier today before the show i prepared a piece of fabric attached to foam interfacing to simulate the body of a bag and i also made a little piece to simulate uh, a strap so it's four layers of strap fabric uh, pressed kind of like double fold bias tape how i normally do with straps and then I just willy-nilly inserted four rivets and as you can see from the back these are the double cap rivets. So what you need to do first with the tool is to see which opening most closely resembles the size of the rivet that you're using. So um, the smallest size is the size side that I'll need to use. I'm going to show you this on the overhead camera how I would proceed before hammering this in place. And then I'm going to uh, step back to the table behind me and actually hammer it in place. Danny kindly asked me to use not this particular table because our cameras are connected to it with a long arm. And if I was hammering on this table, it would make the camera shake. So um, I'm first going to show you how to set it up and then I'll uh, take it back to that table behind me and actually hammer it. So the side with the beveled edge is going to go against the right side of the fabric. So I'll concentrate on this rivet down here. So I'm just gonna flip this over and kind of hover that opening over the rivet, as you can see here. So I'm going to flip the fabric over, keeping that rivet in place in the opening. And this skinny side of the tool is going to be centered in the middle of the rivet, just like that. So what I'm going to do with that is I'm gonna hold that in place and then taking a mallet, this is the only mallet that I hand on hand, the, the seam whacker, um, but you're just going to hammer that in place and it's going to drive the metal tool down into the center of the rivet through the cap and into the, the post of the rivet. So um, I'm going to have Danny switch back over to the front camera. I'm just going to step behind me. I set up a, I have a piece of, a uh, little piece to match our countertops. So you want to make sure you're using something that uh, isn't going to damage your table. Oh, my mic. Sorry, my mic got caught up. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna take this behind me and I'm gonna hammer it in place and then I'm gonna come back to the overhead and show you the results. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna have Danny switch over to the overhead and I'm gonna show you what actually happened when I was hammering it. So. Here's the tool. As you can see, the rivet is uh, has been punctured and it's on the tool. And I just slid that off. The bottom piece uh, was still in here and just lifting it up, you can see that uh, it's been removed. And Danny, switch over to the overhead just one more second. And as you can see, this is where the rivet was. So in the case of my previous attempts, um, when Danny had to remove the rivets, 
um, they went in sideways so he removed them and then I just reinstalled them in the same hole so as you can see it came out pretty cleanly and it's ready for me to insert uh, another rivet the correct way so again this is the rivet removal tool it's from Clumhouse, and I've linked to it in the description and I'm super happy to have this tool because now I can not worry about if I have to remove rivets and uh, it's, it's always a bit nerve wracking when I have to have Danny remove them because uh, I guess there's always a chance that uh, he won't be able to. So um, very lovely tool and um, yeah, I'm sure I'll be using it uh, in the future. So um, I have a question. Okay, items six and seven on my list uh, I'll be talking about next that kind of go together. Um, number six is a mini iron. So I like this um, Cricut Easy Press Mini. There's a few other different types of mini iron out there, such as the Steamfast Iron. Aliso has a mini iron as well. So whatever your preference, I feel like a mini iron is really helpful because number one, you can get into small safe spaces like the inside of the bag, especially when the bag is either finished or um, while you're constructing it. Um, another thing that's great about a mini iron is you can keep it um, next to your sewing machine on the wool mat, which I'll be talking about in just a second. Um, it takes up a very small amount of space, not like the regular sized iron. And um, you can quick, um, if you're assembling quilt blocks, you can press in between um, each piece added to your quilt block. Um, I really, really like having a small iron in addition to my regular iron. Danny's gonna switch to the overhead camera so that I can show you my wool mat. Um, the wool mat, here it is right here, it's a half inch thick, and I admit I have a wool mat in several different sizes. This is the 17 inch by 17 inch square. <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, and as you've probably seen in just about all of my videos, I press on the wool mat. Um, it's handy to keep next to your sewing machine, if, especially if you have a smaller table space. And <clears throat> I just really love using them. They distribute the heat more evenly as well to the front and the back of the project um, quilt blocks or whatever else you're pressing maybe you're making straps and um, I just I've, I've oh, there's a big clump of hair underneath there I've been using mine for years and um, I still use them to this day and they're fantastic <clears throat> okay Danny's going to switch back to the front camera Number eight on my list is duckbill scissors. Duckbill scissors are really great for um, cutting down seams so that you can reduce bulk in your finished bag. And the duckbill scissors, because it has um, that extra flat edge, it holds the fabric away that you don't want to cut um, from the fabric that might be right directly next to it that you do want to trim down. So um, in this next, next demonstration is the duckbill scissors. I would like to show you a little demo because I noticed some questions in my Facebook group this past week about um, bulk in the seam of a bag before doing some top stitching. So for example, in the Baker Street bag, um, this is what I'm talking about as far as bulk in the, the final seam in preparation for the top stitching. And everyone's machine will be different in regards to this, but um, some machines might have difficulty with that final top stitching, especially because this can be thick if you're using cork, foam interfacing, leather, things like that. So I've prepared two pieces of fabric to simulate um, that final top edge of the bag. So here's my two pieces of fabric. They're both attached to foam to simulate that same thickness in the bag. And I've gone ahead and already done the half inch seam allowance, which would be called for in a lot of my bag patterns. So what I'm gonna do to grade the seam is I'm gonna use this duckbill scissors, and this is the Ginger brand. There's other brands of scissors that make duckbill scissors as well, but I linked the Ginger brand in the description because this is the one that I've had for a few years. So basically the duckbill scissors have this um, wide plate over here, and this is what moves fabric out of the way especially if you're just cutting one layer, the duckbill holds that second fabric out of, the out of the way so that you don't cut it by accident. Okay, so let me explain what I'm doing here first and then I'll go ahead and cut. So grading the seams is basically having one of the two seams be a little bit shorter so they're sort of at um, cascading layers. They're not both at the same layer. So for instance, 
if I just sewed this half inch seam allowance and turned my fabrics wrong sides together and press um, this area over here where this um, where these two bottom layers of fabric are can get quite thick and so the purpose of grading the seam is to not have all of the bulk in the same area so I'm just going to go ahead and take the duckbill scissors and I'm going to cut one of the seams in half so to about a quarter of an inch okay so as you can see the seams left alone at a half an inch this one's down to a quarter of an inch because these are at different layers, all the bulk is not concentrated up here. So there's some bulk over here and then the rest is up top over here. So when you go to press wrong sides together and press it, it'll feel quite a bit thinner because of the alternating layers of the seam allowance. And you can do other things with this as well. You can cut both of them down to maybe five eighths and then cut this one smaller just so you get this one trimmed down shorter as well. But um, this is just a quick and easy method and you can use regular scissors for this you don't have to if you don't have a duckbill you can use regular scissors these are just nice for holding that second layer out of the way but just a little tip that can help you reduce bulk especially in the top edge of a bag as you prepare to do some top stitching so right this edge right over here okay so number nine on the list is strap anchors so danny's going to put a picture up on the screen of bronwyn's sublime bag she used some strap anchors on her bag there we go thank you danny as you can see the the handles are attached to the strap anchors that's the silver on the front of the bag and also on the back of the bag strap anchors are super easy to install um, if you feel comfortable installing a magnetic snap with the prongs um, the strap anchors are very similar um, as far as using um, prongs and um, also washers. So um, here's a demonstration on how to install strap anchors. All right, so I have a demonstration for you today. My demonstration is how to attach strap anchors. It's super simple, but I feel like it can give um, an extra added professional look to your bags. I noticed Bronwyn for her Sublime bag that she's making for the Sublime bag so long is uh, utilizing strap anchors right here in this area where I've got the tabs. So you can either use strap anchors on the front and the back of your bag for um, handles like this. You can also use the strap anchors on a bag that has a side strap like this satellite bag. Um, the strap anchors could be utilized in place of the tabs. So I'm gonna jump over to the side camera and show you how to install them. Okay, so I've prepared this little piece of fabric to simulate the front of a bag. I've already attached the fabric to the interfacing, which you definitely want to do first. And uh, here's what the strap anchors look like in the package. So um, you'll get the four um, strap anchors as well as the washers. And I've already went ahead and pulled one out of the package. So I've gone ahead and linked to in the description where you can find these strap anchors and they come in different shapes and finishes so if you're not um, set on this particular shape there's other shapes out there this is the gunmetal finish but there's um, a rose gold a rainbow silver gold um, all sorts of different options so this is um, basically in place of a purse tab because it's got this portion that you attach to the bag and it's already got um, where you might use a D-ring or a triangle ring. It's already got this ring where you can attach to your strap. So this piece would go on the bag. As you can see from the back, there's four prongs. I've already bent two of the prongs down and I'm gonna go ahead and bend the two bottom prongs out. So these are going to go through the right side of your fabric in a similar nature that you would do with your magnetic snaps as your magnetic snaps usually have prongs. And I'm gonna be using two of the washers. So the washers are just gonna go vertically. Normally with the magnetic snaps, my washers go, uh, I guess, kind of horizontally. Um, so this is the reason that I bent the prongs down first is so that I could easily mark the, the placement on my fabric. So you'll need to decide where you want to attach, attach this. I'm just going to arb arbitrarily attach this like so. And I'm just gonna use my pen to mark uh, the prong placement. There we go, it's working. Okay, and you want to just make sure wherever you're attaching um, the strap anchor, you do the same thing on the front and the back of the bag or on the side panels, uh, the same measurements. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and use my seam ripper to make small slits in the fabric. And as always, you always want to start making 
smaller slits, you can always make smaller slits bigger, but if you accidentally make your slit too big, you're kind of stuck. And I usually like to follow up any slits that I make through fabric with a bit of seam sealant, and I'm using fray block here. Just going to put a little dab on, oops, that was a big dab, <laughs> on each of the slits. So this strap anchor is going to go through the right side of the fabric. I'm going to get my iron started because I'm going to reinforce that a little bit too. So let me let that dry for a little bit. I'm also going to use a piece of ultra firm interfacing. So you can use either Peltax or I'm using Decoville Heavy here. I'm also going to mark uh, the prong placement on the ultra firm interfacing. So you just want the interfacing to be larger than your piece so that you have enough to, to hang on to. And I also cut a piece of shape flex that was bigger than the ultra firm interfacing. So that's just a little bit of extra to reinforce this piece as well. And of course I also need to make slits through that interfacing. Okay, so this is going to go through the right side of the fabric and as I mentioned, if your slits are too small, you can always go ahead and make them bigger. Uh, mine looks fine, so I'm gonna go ahead and flip to the wrong side of the fabric where you can see the interfacing. I'm gonna go ahead and slip that Peltex on. It looks like that one needs to be made bigger. Okay, then I'm going to place the washers. And then I'm going to open those prongs outward. And you can either, these were easy enough to do by hand, but you could also lean them up against the edge of your table. And I'm going to go ahead and take the adhesive side of the shape flex and just go ahead and cover that whole piece right there. So I'm just using this to kind of give some extra reinforcements so, since this strap anchor was quite a bit larger than magnetic snaps just to make sure everything's uh, not moving at all in the finished bag. So that's what it looks like on the wrong side of the fabric and that's what that finished strap anchor looks like on the right side of the fabric and it's ready to just go ahead and insert your purse strap, adjustable strap, or handles, whatever you're adding to your project. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that demonstration. As you can see, it's really super simple to attach the strap anchors to your fabric, and I feel like it'll do a little bit of extra to spice up your, your finished bag. Um, so I'd like to invite you now, if you enjoy the live shows, if you enjoy our um, bag making and sewing tutorial videos, if you're watching on Facebook, go ahead and hit the share button right now and share this sewing video with your other sewing friends on Facebook. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, if you're not already subscribed, I hope you will consider subscribing so that you can be the first to hear uh, whenever we go live or whenever we post a new video to the channel. Um, regardless if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, if you could at least hit uh, the like button, which is the little picture of the thumbs up, the likes, shares, and subscribes help us out so much. So thank you so much for doing that. So. I was really laughing during those demonstration videos because I think there were a couple of them where I was using the fray block and I shot out like a huge amount of fray block for each uh, little slit that I cut. <laughs> it almost made me cringe, but obviously um, that, that strap anchor covered most of uh, that spillage of the fray block that came out there. So number 10 on my list, um, kind of going along with the strap theme is uh, strap ends. So I haven't demonstrated this before, but I thought it would be a great um, chance to talk about it because it is one of the things on my list for intermediate bag making. So Danny's gonna switch uh, to the overhead camera. I've prepared um, a few strap ends with different substrates. Um, actually, thank you, you read my mind, Danny. So I've got two over here. This one's with quilting cotton and shape flex. Um, I've got a cork um, piece attached to a strap end here. And then I've got also uh, the quilting cotton attached uh, to the longer strap end. So um, in my duckbill scissors demonstration, you might have caught a glimpse of my Baker Street bag that I made in the rose gold cork. Um, for that particular bag, I had the straps um, on the front and back of the bag when it was finished, kind of hanging off onto um, the top portion of the bag and it was riveted in place. Um, for that particular bag, I could have used strap ends and had sort of a little bit nicer and slightly more professional finish. 
Um, so strap ends are super easy uh, to attach and um, I'm gonna walk you through um, how to uh, make one out of quilting cotton and we'll briefly talk also um, about the cork. Um, let me show you also. So the strap end has a channel. So I'm gonna be preparing the fabric and then it'll just um, pop into the channel and then on the back side, there's two holes uh, for screws and the scr screws um, will also secure uh, the end of the strap. So let me pull out my little sample that I prepared before the show. Obviously, this being a strap, it's going to be a lot longer. I've just got um, a little piece over here for the demonstration. So what I did was I cut a piece of quilting cotton and attached shape flex to the back and I trimmed the shape flex before fusing it in place away from the bottom half inch because I wanted the the bottom edge, the bottom short edge of the strap to be finished as well. So I press it toward the wrong side by half inch along this edge where I cut back the shape flex. And then I pressed the top and bottom edges in toward, uh, sorry, first I pressed it in half wrong sides together. Then I pressed it um, toward the center crease along the top and bottom edges. And then I repressed and let me just push that in there. So all raw edges are enclosed. And then what I did was I top stitched um, the three finished edges using an eighth of an inch seam allowance and a slightly lengthened stitch length. So my normal stitch length is two and a half millimeters. And for the top stitching of the strap, I use three millimeters meters up stitch length. And so this is what my piece looked like when it was finished. So for this, the smaller strap end, so I'll just refer to them as uh, the small and the large. Uh, the small is about one inch wide and the large is a scant one and a half inch. So for my fabric, I cut the fabric and certainly feel free to uh, make a little sample before you start to see how you like the width of the finished strap. So for this one, I cut it, uh, the fabric, a hair less than three and seven eighths of an inch wide. Um, I did make another one first and I cut it a little bit wider. And as you can see, the fabric fits all the way on the inside. And for the first one that I assembled with the fabric a little bit wider, I could see like, like a hair of fabric on either side. So that's what I mean by kind of making a little sample first, just so you can see what your preferences are. Uh, but this is the one that I liked the best. And then I also cut, um, I made one with cork, but this is only three layers of cork and there's no interfacing on the cork one. And I cut the cork for this smaller strap end at two and seven eighths of an inch wide. Again, I played around with a couple pieces and this is just the width that I preferred sitting in the strap end. So let me show you how to attach this and, and get the screws put inside. So. This is completely optional, but if you'd like to put a, a bit of permanent uh, glue on the inside, perhaps fabric tack, um, you can do so. I would suggest if you do decide to do that, just putting a little dab in the center because once you put the strap, the end of the strap in, the glue will kind of disperse and you don't want it coming out either end. Another tip for that is if you are using the glue, make sure you insert the strap fabric straight down into the channel rather than kind of sliding in it sliding it through the side because that might push some of the glue out the other end. Uh, so once the strap is in there, go ahead and flip to the back side. And here's the two holes over here. The strap ends come with these tiny little screws. By the way, be really careful because, goodness, I, I can't tell you how many tiny little screws I've lost over the years for various things like uh, twist locks and things of the sort. So let me get both of these inserted. You'll just need a small screwdriver. Danny, what's the tip called of this particular screwdriver? Phillips. Phillips screwdriver. Thank you, Danny. Um, I asked for his manual set, but he had this, it's called a wow stick. This is the first time I used it, but it worked. I really loved using it for installing screws. Um, if you press this button toward the head, it goes in the right direction. And if you need to remove a screw, you just hit this button and it removes it and the light also lights up, which I thought was super cool. And I'll definitely be hijacking uh, Danny's put tool. Oh, put it on the tip first. Thank you. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, as you can tell, I don't use 
uh, tools that often. <laughs> All right, so I know you, maybe I can hold the next one sideways uh, so I can show you the view as it's going, the screws going in. All right, so as you can see, that was went in super easy. The ends of the strap look really nice. And uh, we do have these strap ends in the shop in the six different finishes and just something to kind of jazz up your bag if you have some straps where either the handle or the strap will be showing on the outside of the finished bag. And again, this little screwdriver um, is called a wow stick in case you're interested. I don't have the link in the description, but I'll try to add it uh, after the show because uh, it is a pretty nifty little device. So I hope you enjoyed tonight's bag lab. That was um, 10 items for intermediate bag making. Um, Danny mentioned there were a couple of uh, comments and questions while the demonstration was going. Um, Susan wanted to know, do you use a clapper? I do have a clapper in a couple different sizes. Um, so a clapper is good for pressing seams. It kind of holds the heat um, against the fabric or the seam while you're pressing um, it's actually a great complement to a wool mat. Um, have the wool mat on your tabletop, um, your fabric or quilt block, whatever you're pressing on the wool mat, and then the clapper goes on top. So what you'll do is you'll use your iron or seam from your iron, depending on what you're using for your project. Iron your project on top of the wool mat or your ironing board. And then the wood clapper goes on top and you just hold it in place for a few seconds and it kind of holds the heat against your project and gives um, a nice um, extra crisp um, seam or finish, depending on, uh, again, what the, the item is, if it's a bag you're working on or quilt blocks. Randy says, it's fun to see the different versions of Sarah through the years. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, Randy, when I was watching um, all those demonstrations played back, all the different hairstyles, uh, different shirts, which I still have, but maybe some of them I haven't worn in a while. Danny said, I can tell that's a summer video because your freckles are super dark in, in one of the demonstrations. So it was uh, certainly interesting to um, check out uh, the So Sweetness Social Sunday through the years. Um, I keep telling myself I don't need duckbill duck duck scissors, but I do. <laughs> I think that about a, a lot of different notions that I see. Sometimes I'm like, I don't know, do I really need that? And then, of course, something comes up. Um, such as that uh, rivet removal tool. Um, all right, I know t tonight's show was a little bit extended compared to our usual so show. So I, I know I answered a, a few questions. Uh, we're just gonna answer a few questions tonight and then get over to the giveaway. And of course, I'll be back again next Sunday with Danny answering lots more questions. Uh, but Crystal says, I tore apart an old horse pad that I did not uh, use any more that had a wool mat inside and voila, a 32 inch by 32 inch wool mat, one inch thick. Wow, that must be awesome, especially being one inch thick and what a creative use for something um, that you already had that you don't use anymore. Um, Elaine says, do you sell strap ends in your shop? Yes, um, there's actually a link in the description to um, the strap ends product listing on our website. Um, they come in sets of four, um, the strap ends with uh, the screws that you need to install them. All right, tonight's giveaway um, is for the Tudor bag video and PDF pattern plus a packet of soft and stable. Um, if you happen to be the winner of this tonight's prize and you already own that pattern and video, of course, I'm happy to swap it out for a different one. Um, but I went through the Facebook group earlier today and pulled a few of your Tudor bag makes um, and Danny's going to post those on the screen now. Oh, one more question from Rob. Are the new zipper pulls stamped on both sides? Sorry if you already said and I missed it. That's a great question. Let me pull one of those out. Thank you, Danny. So yes, they are stamped on both sides with the image. Um, yeah, because I know when you have the zipper opened or closed, um, you'll see one side or the other depending on um, if your project is shut or not. So yeah, great question, Rob. Thank you so much. There you go. All right, Danny, take it away with your little uh, carousel that you prepared. Um, so this one was made by Amy in nurse themed fabric. Um, I thought this one was super creative and I loved how this uh, one was finished. Um, Diane made this one. Uh, we had a Tudor bag sew along uh, a bit ago and um, this one I, I believe was created as part of the sew along. 
Joanne made her tutor bag in elephant cork that we have in the shop. Um, I really love, especially with the black handles and the zipper on the front, looks amazing. Karen made hers in a purple batik fabric. Um, I just love, I, I consider this a confident beginner bag, but I just love seeing all the different versions and the fabric definitely makes, makes it. Katie made hers in uh, vinyl fabric and her textured exterior, they go perfect together. Um, Laura made hers and I believe in her Facebook post, she said this was her first bag ever. This is A++ for your first bag. Um, Lynn made hers in sort of a Disneyland inspired fabric with rose gold uh, textured vinyl. Looks perfect. Namrata made hers in a tulip pink fabric uh, from her Eden fabric line a few years ago. Love the pop of the turquoise on the handles and the strap. Nikki made one with um, a floral print paired with uh, the natural cork fabric. I love seeing prints paired with the cork, really makes the prints pop. And this last one was made in skull fabric by Terry and she used the same fabric, kind of made a double-sided strap with her exterior fabric for those handles. So uh, a little bit of inspiration for you for the Tudor bag. Um, the giveaway winner will be randomly drawn at the end of the day this Saturday. Um, out of all of the comments left on YouTube and Facebook, we add all those together and I'll announce the winner on next Sunday's show. Um, Susan, said, Susan said, my daughter made sure to remind me to subscribe and hit the bell. Thank you so much, Susan and daughter. I really appreciate that. Um, I have an extra bonus question for you that you can answer in the comments right now. And my question is, what is a sewing notion that you seldom use but have to have. So I would say for me, ding, 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 that uh, rivet removal tool that I mentioned earlier, hardly ever use it, but when you need it, you have to have it. So that's, that's mine for tonight's question. Thank you so very much for joining me for Social Sunday. I really, really appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being part of our bag making community. Um, Danny and I will see you next week for next week's Social Sunday show. Have a great week and happy sewing. Bye, everybody.